Hello, you are most welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Real Impartation Moment on Tuesday Night Anatomy with Daniel Okwan. Now, today's section, I want to quickly run through some introductory bits of neuroanatomy. And this area, yes, will be more of the nervous system, yes, because we are not going to go into my detail of it. But in later sections, we will try and then go through the various aspects of the neuroanatomy. So without much ado, let's quickly run through this overview. Now, very important is that, in fact, the body has about 11 systems, and out of these 11 systems, two of them being the nervous system as well as the endocrine system, are very important components. We refer to them as the coordination systems. Or what they do is that they help integrate the various, I mean, body systems. And therefore, we also call them the integrative, you know, systems. Now, one important thing is that, yes, what they are doing is that they control or regulate biological activities. Okay. And they act by receiving information from, you know, other body parts. And of course, they send effector, you know, commands, so to speak. Okay. For various uh, motor actions to be elicited. So that is why we are calling them the coordinate system or the integrative system. But one thing is that there are some kind of differences between them, which I want to quickly run through them. So with respect to the signal, okay, with respect to the signal, what we are saying is that the nervous system is mainly essentially, you know, electrical impulses, okay, that will be going through it. And therefore, you know, the endocrine system, yes, it will be chemical impulses mainly, yes, by way of secretion of hormones. Then the pathway taken by, you know, of course, the nervous system will be mainly through neurons. Okay, they are the excitable cells in the nervous system. And then, of course, for the endocrine system, okay, the product will be released directly into, of course, the blood to affect a target organ. Then with respect to speed of, you know, conduction or speed of, I mean, information flow, then what we are saying is that in the case of nervous system, because it's more or less electrical in nature, yes, it's going to be very fast, very rapid compared to that of the endocrine system. And then the effect, because nervous system is very fast, likewise, its effect is also short-lived. But in the case of, the, I mean, endocrine system, it's actually going to have a long-lasting effect. Then what we are saying that in the case of nervous system, it could be voluntary or involuntary. Yes, we see the somatic nervous system being voluntary, you know, the autonomic being involuntary. Then, of course, for endocrine, it is solely, you know, involuntary because you have no control, uh, you know, re with respect to the type of hormone which will be secreted, you know, inside you. Then, of course, with respect to the target, you know, action, target area of target, I mean, action, be the cell or tissues around, yes, it's going to be by way of the nervous system, yes, usually localized, okay, usually localized. But for endocrine, the hormone which is released into the blood usually, you know, travels, you know, quite uh, longer distance to affect, you know, a target organ, okay, so it's a bit distant compared to that in the case of the nervous system. So these are some distinctions that we have between the nervous system and, of course, the endocrine system being the two endocrine systems that we have. So we get to know the various components of the nervous system, the brain, spinal cord, you know, the various nerves. And, of course, for endocrine system, talk about, you know, the pituitary gland, you know, talk about the thyroid gland, other, you know, glands. When we look at endocrine system, we look at all these ones. So importantly, the nervous system is doing three main functions is doing three main things the first thing is that yes it's having you know what we call sensory neurons okay it's having sensory neurons so these sensory neurons will receive information from sensory receptors okay from the environment and when i talk about the environment we are talking about both internal environment as well as external environment okay so sensory input will be taken there so it will be a function of the nervous system then of course within the spinal cord and of course the brain yes that is where, you know, uh, integration is actually going to take place, processing of that kind of information which has been received from the environment, okay? And then from there, yes, based on previous, I mean, experience, other processing will take place for an appropriate, you know, action to be taken. And these actions will be the output. So the motor output, yes, either it will cause a muscle to contract, and these muscles, yes, we talk about, you know, skeletal muscles, smooth muscles, cardiac muscles, yes, as well as even glands to secrete, okay? So depending on, you know, what type of, I mean, uh, sensory information which was received, yes, will, I mean, 
or I mean direct the kind of response which will be elicited okay so we see these ones so that's what we are going to do the three main functions being the sensory function so for instance breathing the depth of breathing pressure of skin yes pain touch when all these things will be sensed and it will be taken to through the sensory pathway afferent pathway eventually to the brain or to the spinal cord that the control centers will be located in the brain yes for appropriate action to be taken then that action yes will have to be elicited through i mean i mean the motor neurons okay or through the efferent pathway to what we call either i mean the muscle or to a gland to secrete appropriately so these are one things that you have to actually know so for instance if you have to blink your eye you have to stretch then all these ones will be the output which will be coming through of course the motor pathway so all these things we will see that we see that of course the brain will be very important in memory in language in comprehension in speech and all that in intelligence we see all those ones right now so what you, one important thing that we have to know uh, and very important is that hormones require more time than that of nerves so nerves they are going to carry out these processes quite rapidly so it means that for emergency situations you don't need the nerve i mean the endocrine system because the endocrine system may take days or weeks or even hours for you to elicit a particular response so there we are now if we take the nervous system then by way of the components we are going to have two main divisions so there are two main divisions of the nervous we have the central nervous system which are going to be found in the midline of the body and then we have the peripheral nervous system at the periphery of the body so one thing is that if you take the central nervous system it has two components being the brain as well as of course the spinal cord being the brain as well as the spinal cord now we will see what they are going to do but essentially what they are going to do is that they are going to have what we call control centers that's, that's where the processing and everything is going to take place okay so we see those ones but importantly if you take um you know the brain as well as of course you know the spinal cord they are forming actually the central nervous system now anything outside the brain and the spinal cord will be forming part of the peripheral nervous system so for instance there will be some nerves which will be coming from the brain which we call them cranial nerves because that's, that's the cranial most portion of the central nervous system so those nerves which will be coming from the cranial most portion of the central nervous system will be called cranial nerves and then those ones which will be coming from the caudal portion or coming from the spinal cord will be called you know the spinal nerves they will form part of what you call the peripheral nervous system now one key thing i want to show you is that yes the peripheral nervous system will be carrying this kind of sensory information from both the internal as well as the external environment so for instance you can see that this one we have somatic sensory yes fiber yes i mean nerve fiber which is taking some kind of sensation from the skin okay either it is touch it is pain you know it is temperature whatever it should be taken from the skin and then through this afferent pathway get into the control centers within the brain okay so that's the sensory pathway then if that process yes there's going to be that kind of processing in the brain you know when that happens within the i mean the central nervous system yes then through the efferent pathway it will be taken okay to what we call the organ yes for the appropriate you know motor action to be elicited so for instance through a motor uh, pathway you know the somatic nervous system for instance, getting to the skeletal muscle, somatic body wall, to the skeletal muscle, so that it can contract appropriately. Now, one thing that we have to know is that if you take the peripheral nervous system, okay, what we are saying that we can divide it broadly into two main areas, okay, we can have what we call the motor division, as well as, of course, the sensory division. So, sensory division will take information from both the body wall, okay, that's the visceral, as well as, of course, uh, sorry, I mean, somatic, as well as, of course, the visceral being from the organs, okay, to, of course, the control centers within the brain. So, when that happens, then the processing will take place within the brain, then the output will have to come through, of course, the efferent pathway, through, of course, I mean, some kind of uh, motor neurons. So, we see that we have. Uh, Apart from the sensory or the afferent division, we also have the motor or the efferent division. And the efferent division will contain, yes, motor nerve fibers will be there. And what they will do is that they will conduct impulses from the, yes, the CNS to, of course, um, the target organ, being actually the muscle or being a gland to secrete or to contract, you know, appropriately. But one thing is that when you take the sensory pathway, 
okay now let me use this one. i'll show you another diagram to illustrate better now if you look at this motor division you can have of course the somatic portion and of course the autonomic portion the somatic portion of course we said is the body wall so somatic motor they are going to be voluntary okay and they'll conduct impulses from the cns to the skeletal muscle the keyword is the skeletal muscle to the body wall and then from for the autonomic which are involuntary okay coming from what you call the visceral motor yeah they will conduct impulses from the cns to of course the cardiac muscles to the smooth muscles and of course to the glands to secrete or to contract now if we take the autonomic nervous system then we are going to have two divisions with respect to the motor uh, portion we are going to have two divisions we are going to have of course the sympathetic division as well as the parasympathetic division now you know sympathetic division we say it works under the three f's that's a flight fight flight and flee okay and what they do is that because you are going you are in danger then what they do is that this portion of the autonomic nervous system helps to mobilize you know energy okay for various activities such running you know so we will see all those ones in our later sections then for the parasympathetic nervous system yes what they do is that they help conserve energy so they work under the what we call the rest and digest you know uh, phenomenon so it helps you conserve energy so we see all these ones in our later section so other classification which i want to show you with respect to we've seen that the central nervous system will be made up of the brain and the spinal cord yes the peripheral nervous system yes with this division i, I really appreciate this one better yes we're going to have a sensory division which is the afferent pathway and then we have the motor or the efferent pathway now for the sensory division we are going to have the somatic sensory as well as the visceral sensory now somatic to the body wall and if, even with the body wall we are going to have the general sensation as well as the special sensation now, general sensation including touch, pain, temperature, pressure, yes, proprioception, with respect to the skin, body wall, as well as, you know, the limbs. So, skin is to the body wall, yes, limbs to the body wall. So, what they are doing is that, and so, all these, I mean, sensations, okay, will be somatic sensory, okay, with respect to the body wall. Then, for the special, I mean, somatic sensory ones, you are going to have some like hearing, you know, equilibrium, uh, vision, they are all sens uh, special sensory uh, portion of what we call the sensory division now for the visceral sensory yes that one too, we also have the general sensation as well as you know the special sensation now for the general sensation for instance talk about stretch you know the tension of the stomach and all that pain temperature you know chemical changes as well as the nutrition of the viscera you know cause something like nauseation as well as you know hunger all those ones will be general sensations coming from the viscera from the organ itself but the special ones which will be detected by the organ, so for instance, taste for the tongue, helping in tasting as well as, you know, the, you know, the smelling, which or the olfaction, which could be by, of course, you know, uh, for instance, in the nasal cavity, lateral or the nasal cavity. Yes, we are going to see all these ones. And those ones are special sensations. Now, the other hand of the peripheral nervous, apart from the sensory division, is the motor division. Now, the motor division, we are going to have the somatic nervous system, as well as, of course, the autonomic nervous system. Now, somatic, I've already told you, the body wall, and that one is going to cause, you know, is going to cause contractions and perhaps relaxations of what we call the skeletal muscles. But in case of the smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, as well as the glands secreting, will be by what we call the autonomic nervous system. Now, if you take the autonomic nervous system, then we are going to, with respect to, I mean, the motor division, we are going to divide it into, of course, that sympathetic and the parasympathetic that we've already seen. Sympathetic working under the three Fs, fight, flight, and flee. And, of course, parasympathetic under, you know, rest and digest, helping to conserve energy. So, there we are, once again, just to show you, yes, that's the, sorry. Um, so, there we are, here is the brain. And then the spinal cord, and then the brain perception and processing of sensory stimuli, okay, which came in through the afferent pathway through sensory neurons. And there will be also important execution of voluntary motor activity in, te in terms of the somatic aspect, and then of course regulation of homeostatic mechanisms in terms of the autonomic aspect. So we will see all those ones. And then we have also the spinal cord, the spinal cord will initiate reflexes from, of course, the ventral horn. Okay, that's somatic. From a lateral horn will be autonomic. So we see the spinal cord, uh, it part. And then the green, I mean, 
that's within the gray matter and then pathways for you know sensory uh, and motor functions between the periphery and the brain so what we're going to see is that yes I mean certain things will have to go into the brain and eventually you have to travel through the spinal cord before getting to the brain and of course those kind of uh, outputs will have to travel through of course the spinal cord before it gets to the periphery so that's what we see now apart from the brain and the spinal cord forming found themselves in the i mean uh, uh, in the central compartment or the central axis of the body okay or the median plane any other thing which leaves them and comes come out will be called be part of what you call the peripheral nervous system so for instance we are going to have some nerves coming from the brain itself being the cranial nerves some nerves coming from the spinal cord being the spinal nerves and these nerve fibers some of them will contain sensory yes other ones will be motor in nature and of course uh, we will see all those ones some of them will also be missed then of course there will be other things along the spinal nerves okay which is also uh, along the spinal cord but actually paravertebral or along or parallel to the spinal cord they are actually outside the central nervous system and therefore still part of the peripheral nervous system we call them ganglia we see ganglia and nuclei later yes they are going to help in reception of what sensory stimuli okay by what you call the dorsal root we see that the dorsal root will bear a like ganglion as well as from even the cranial ganglion okay and of course one important thing is that there's relay of visceral motor you know uh, responses by autonomic ganglia you see that that is where relay of most of these autonomic you know uh, nerves pathway will actually take place you see that and then because yeah, now you get to know that the brain alone contains about 100 billion neurons but what happens is that yes uh, if you don't use a lot of uh, certain synapses then they tend to get um, let me say redundant and for that matter what happens is that usually it may get to around about 64 billion neurons you know at uh, let me say middle age about 64 billion will be left but one thing is that yes we're able to segregate this enteric nervous system okay out of this kind of autonomic nervous formerly it was part of what we call therefore part of the peripheral nervous system being part of the autonomic nervous system actually yes this enteric nervous system is a special portion of the autonomic nervous system okay that we find in the git okay and because it contains about 100 million neurons then it makes sense that we put it under its own nervous system because this one it can I mean work independently of the brain and of course the spinal cord okay so helping in various digestions and that's why we call it the brain gut I mean the brain gut you see that so um, having seen the overview now one thing that we have to know is to see how you know the brain develops so one thing over here is that yes now usually we have what we call the uh, the trigeminal you know layer or we are having the gem layers being of course the ectoderm the endoderm the mesoderm but what, ha what happens is that with the help of this thing which eventually becomes the nucleus pulposus being the notochord okay notochord okay being the central uh, or the azial mesoderm you see that when we look at the embryology so notochord yes we secrete some factors so that they convert a portion of the, what we call the ectoderm into what we call neuroectoderm Okay, so the neuroectoderm differentiates from what we call ectoderm, from the factors produced by the notochord. Okay, so when that happens, then we say that the neural plate, uh, sorry, I mean, there will be that kind of separation, okay, from what we call the ectoderm. Okay, so we have the neural plates only over there. Now, what happens is that, yes, still the factors will be produced, and what happens is that this uh, neuroectoderm begins to fold. When it begins to fold, then it forms what you call uh, a neural, uh, I mean, the, this neural ectoderm is actually going to form what we call this neural plate. It's that kind of neural plate that we are talking about. It begins to fold to become what we call, uh, I mean, the neural uh, fold, so to speak. So this fold then continues eventually to become what we call the neural tube. But what happens is that as it folds, there will be some regions of condensation of cells, which we call the neural crest cells. We will see those ones but one important thing for now is that the neural crest cells will form important portion of the peripheral nervous system okay so it will separate so for instance you can see what we are seeing here yes we having this spinal ganglia which are actually part of the peripheral nervous system okay so we see that because what happens that this neutral cord uh, sorry this uh, neural crest cells okay 
which will be found over here we will separate independently independently from of this uh, what you call neural tube okay so that's what we are going to see it will have yes mesenchyma derivative as well as neural derivatives but as far as the neural derivatives are concerned as well as the mesenchyma derivatives are concerned most of them will give rise to components of the peripheral nervous system so we now have a neural tube okay so that's what we are going to have now it is this neural tube which is going to actually have what we call an anterior neural pore and a posterior neural pore which we later will have to close okay so one key thing over here is that every component of the central nervous system will be produced from what you call the neural tube and remember this neural tube yes it's coming from what we call the ectoderm as a result of secretion of some factors by this notochord converting this i mean uh, this ectoderm into what we call a neural plate or that the neuro ectoderm so that eventually begins to fold form this neural fold and then eventually having this kind of tube okay forming part uh, becoming what we call the component of the central nervous system and then we said that there will be other condensation of cells okay as it falls okay and those cells will be called neural crest cells and that is why because the neural crest cells will be make i mean be producing a lot of these components i mean talk about most components of peripheral nervous system we call it the fourth gem layer we will see those when we look at the embryology now one key thing is that yes after the neuro i mean this uh what you call notochord okay we eventually become what you call the nucleus pulposis okay neuro nucleus pulposis of the intervertebral disc so there we are as it's as the neural tube yes uh, forms there will be two openings there will be a cranial i mean pore which we call it the rostral neural pore or the cranial neural pore or better still the anterior neural pore and then of course there will be a caudal or a posterior neural pore okay neural pore will be produced now one thing is that the posterior neural, neural pore or the caudal neural pore will have to close around the 27 Failure to close will result in what we call spina bifida, whether it's a quarter or whatever. Yes, it will result in some form of spina bifida, depending on the severity or the inability for this neural pore to close. And then for the anterior neural pore, yes, it's supposed to close around you know day 25 of intra uh, embryonic period, okay, or the intra uterine life period, okay. If that one fails to close, then it will lead to a condition we call and then cephaly okay and then cephaly will result and usually if in the case of an encephaly okay what happens is that the brain as well as the cranial vaults and that the carbaria or carbarium will be grossly more formed okay however there wouldn't be much problem with respect to you know the high brain development okay so that's what i mean we are going to see so this is what i want to actually show you that yeah this is the neural tube the neural tube will begin to modify and with respect to the modification, it is that portion which is going to give rise to what we call the brain. Okay, so with respect to the modification, it's going to have three primary vesicles. Okay, the neural tube will present with three primary vesicles. And these prim primary vesicles from the cranial end to the caudal aspect, we are going to have the forebrain. Those ones are going to form the forebrain. And that is what we call prosencephalon. So if you have prosencephalon, yes, that is the forebrain portion. And I also have what you call this one, which is going to form the midbrain, and that's what we call mesencephalon. Okay, and then we also have what you call those past, which is going to form what you call the hindbrain, and that's what we call rhombencephalon. Rhombencephalon. Okay, so we have these three primary vesicles yes, prosencephalon, mesencephalon, and of course, rhombencephalon. Now, then of course, that portion is going to form the spinal cord, then continues, okay, you know, uh, caudal to what we call the rhombencephalon then later what happened that these primary vesicles will differentiate or will develop to have what you call five secondary vesicles you know secondary will be produced from the primary so five secondary i mean vesicles this tells us that yes actually the one which is in the mesencephalon doesn't change but those ones which is in the prosencephalon and rhombencephalon will divide into two each so for instance the Present cephalon, you know, pro means before, so pro present cephalon. Present cephalon will give rise to the outermost portion or the most cranial portion, being what you call the telencephalon. Okay, and then we also have what we call the diencephalon. Now, one key thing over here is that the telencephalon, 
is essential going for what we call the cerebral hemispheres. The left and right, you know, cerebral hemispheres. And within it, one important ventricle that we are going to find over there will be the lateral ventricle, the left and right lateral ventricles. Because we are going to have two cerebral hemispheres, left and right cerebral hemispheres, we are going to have two lateral ventricles. And then for the diencephalon, it will give rise to, of course, the thalamus, you know, the hypothalamus, as well as even the epithalamus. Okay, so, and within it, within thalamus, we are going to find what you call the third ventricle. Okay, so within the diencephalon, we are going to find the third ventricle. So we have two lateral ventricles, so there's the third ventricle. And then, again, we are going to have what we call the hindbrain, which we call a rhombencephalon. Rhombencephalon will give rise to what we call metencephalon, okay, second, uh, secondary vesicle, and of course, myelencephalon, secondary vesicle. So myelencephalon, secondary vesicle, is the most caudal portion of these secondary vesicles. Because, of course, Milo has something to do with the spinal cord. The one which is more adjacent, more close to what we call the, uh, I mean, the spinal cord will be myelencephalon. So the metencephalon will give rise to what we call the pons and, of course, the cerebellum. Okay, pons and epicerebellum. And, of course, myelencephalon will give rise to what, what we call the medulla, medulla oblongata. And within these areas, okay, of the rhombencephalon, we are going to find the fourth ventricle, the fourth ventricle. So we see those ones, how the lymph, you know, actually, sorry, how the CNS actually flows through all these areas. So that is what we are going to see. And then of course, the spinal cord then follows, then follows. Now, so don't don't forget this, that if it is myelencephalon, it has something to do with the spinal cord and it's the medulla oblongata where it's continuous inferiorly with the spinal cord. So, you know, myelencephalon will give rise to medulla oblongata. Now, one point that we have to know, yes, regarding, you know, uh, the brain, yes, we've seen that we are going to have, of course, the telencephalon, who is forming the cerebral hemispheres, left and right cerebral hemispheres, okay? And then we are going to have the diencephalon, which will be, I mean, actually coming from the thalamus, hypothalamus, epithalamus, yes, by way of, of course, the pineal gland. Then, of course, we are going to also have, uh, I mean, what you call, I mean, the midbrain, okay, being the, coming from mesencephalon. Then, of course, you know, the cerebellum, and, of course, the pons, being the metencephalon, and then for myelencephalon will be, of course, the medulla oblongata. But importantly, I want to show you the loops that we find in what we call the telencephalon, okay, being the cerebral hemisphere. So we are going to have frontal loop, yes, frontal loop, yes. Now, within the frontal loop, we are going to have what we call, I mean, the prefrontal area where we have solved problems. Then we're going to have the speech area, the broadcast area. I'll take time and go through these ones with you. You know, area 44 and 45 being the broadcast area for speech articulation. Now, one thing too is that now the brain, we have a lot of convolutions, okay? Now, these convolutions are known as gyri, okay? And then the spaces or the, uh, let me say, the grooves in between them are known as, you know, the sulci. Okay, so we have these sulci and of course the gyri. So the brain is that kind of having those kind of convolutions, so to speak. But one thing is that there will be a sulcus which will run over this way. Okay, so this sulcus is known as what we call the central sulcus. Central sulcus. Okay, so central, no, this one, this is the central sulcus. Okay, central sulcus. Now, just in front of the central sulcus, we are going to have what we call the uh, the primary, you know, motor area, primary motor area. Okay, so that's why we help in what we call motor control. And one thing is that we get to know that the brain is going to have left and right hemispheres. Motor activities in the left part of the body, okay, will be controlled by the I mean, right hemisphere, and motor activities in that of the, uh, I mean right part of the body will be controlled by what we call the left hemisphere of the brain. So there's that kind of decreasation of fibers. So you see later on that it will be that kind of decreasation of fibers. And that is why yeah, this kind of phenomenon is taking place. Okay. So there's that kind of contralateral control of motor activity with respect to the hemispheres of the brain. Okay. That's very good. Now, behind the central sulcus, we are going to have what we call 
I mean, the post central gyros. Okay, so there's a pre central gyros where we are going to have what we call the motor, I mean, area. Okay, primary motor area. Then the primary sensory area will be behind the central sulcus. And that is what we call the, I mean, the primary sensory area. Okay, primary sensory area. And that is why the parietal loop, yes, will be important in touch perception, you know, body orientation and sensory discrimination. Okay, will be done by the parietal, you know, loop. Then importantly, yes, the occipital loop mainly for, I mean, vision, okay? So area where we have the occipital loop, yes, for sight, visual reception, and visual interpretation will be done in the occipital loop. And then, of course, you know, parietal loop where the ear is located around the area, yes, we have help in auditory processing, you know, language comprehension. Now, get to know, this one is language comprehension, and that is where we have the awareness area. Now, in the frontal loops, we have where speech will be produced, and that's the broadcast area. Which means that, yes, uh, if someone, for instance, yeah, usually you find this in the broadcast area will be fine, usually in the left lobe of the, I mean, the brain. Okay, left lobe of the fr frontal lobe of the brain. But in case of female, there's an accessory, I mean, broadcast area, okay, in there. And broadcast area is important in, I mean, production of speech. So, for instance, if there's some kind of cerebral vascular accident, okay, stroke, some kind of stroke, and there is no blood supply getting to what we call the broadcast area, then what will happen is that the patient may have inability to speak. Although, could formulate, could understand whatever is going on, because the awareness area perhaps is intact, then what will happen is that the problem will be the articulation of speech. And that even goes on to explain why, you know, if, if you have, uh, let's say, a male and a female, you know, both of them presenting with stroke to the left uh, lobe of the, I mean, left uh, lobe of the frontal loop or the left hemisphere of the frontal loop actually yes then that what will happen is that usually the female may be able to speak you know slightly compared to that of the male and that even also explains why you know if you have a neonate okay a child a female child learns to you know speak earlier compared to that of the female then of course you know to uh, with respect to of course the midbrain you know the brain stem okay including the pons and medulla oblongata yes we are going to have what we call the brain stem so remember brain stem is equal to midbrain pons and medulla oblongata these ones represent the brain stem and they will be very important in involuntary responses you see those ones and then of course being a part of the metencephalon being the cerebellum yes will be important in balancing and muscle coordination push and all that yes will be done by what we call by the kind case of the cerebellum. You see all those ones in greater detail. So, in summary, what we are saying is that, yes, uh, we are going to have the cerebrum, and the cerebrum, that's actually the, I mean, the telencephalon, conscious thought and processes, intellectual functions, memory storage and processing, conscious and subconscious regulation of skeletal muscle, you know, contractions. So all those ones will be done by what you call the telencephalon being the cerebrum. Then if we take the diencephalon, yes, we said the diencephalon will include the thalamus. That the thalamus is the relay station. So the information which you have to come from lower regions of, you know, the, I mean, the, I mean, the brain, and then let's say upper regions of the brain, that, that kind of, you know, that kind of crossing or that kind of transition from either way, moving from a higher portion of the brain to a lower portion below the thalamus, or come from lower portion below the thalamus to upper portion above thalamus, okay, in the brain, we have to go through it. So that's actually a very important relay station. That's the thalamus. And then of course, you know, the hypothalamus controlling emotions, you know, talk about hunger, tests, you know, sexual drive and all that, you know, very important in homeostasis, okay, you know, temperature control and all that, okay, will be done by, of course, the hypothalamus and to also release what we call releasing hormones to produce releasing hormones which will be very important in controlling activities by of what we call the pituitary gland the basal gland then of course if you also take uh, some hormones you know talk about oxytocin and of course uh, you know oxytocin and of course uh, adh antidiuretic hormone vasopressin yes they will also be produced by the hypothalamus although they will be stored in the posterior pituitary gland we will see those ones later de greater detail later then if you take the midbrain yes being part of yes i told that the midbrain as well as the pons 
and the medulla oblongata who form part of the brain stem brain stem so you could see that it's more or less like it represents something like a stem okay so that one midbrain will be important in, process, in processes involving visual and auditory data yes it's also generate reflexive you know somatic motor responses and to maintain consciousness okay very important and then for pons release you know sensory information to what we call cerebellum and thalamus and it will help in subconscious somatic and visceral motor i mean activities and then of course for medulla oblongata we also release sensory information to thalamus okay and to other portions of the brainstem then of course autonomic centers for regulation of visceral function including the cardiovascular system respiratory system and of course digestive system yes pons will also have those kind of centers as well then for cerebellum cerebellum will be important in controlling what we call i mean complex somatic yes motor patterns you know so that it can help control muscle coordination and of course posture and all that and so also adjust output of other somatic motor centers in the brain and spinal cord so that's what we are going to see so i told you you can see these are the gyri and then the you know the groups in the they are the soul side or as well as even the fishes now those ones what we've seen is that we've seen just one portion of the brain so i see it's a sagittal section but if i take you know uh, a transverse section okay through the brain right if i take a transverse section through the brain then what, what i'm going to see is that yes i'm going to see that yeah the brain will present what we call gray matter as well as white matter which are located in the two cerebral hemispheres so we have this okay so this uh, will be one of the hemispheres then there's another one okay so these are the hemispheres of the brain so let's say this is the i mean uh, this is the left hemisphere this is the right hemisphere okay of the brain now what happens is that generally you see there will be some kind of fibers which will connect them okay now connecting these hemispheres mainly which will be the largest commercial fiber that we have in the human body known as corpus callosum will connect what we call the i mean the right hemisphere of the brain to of course the left hemisphere of the brain now within each hemisphere we are going to have that the outermost portion you know is more or less green because it has a lot of you know cell bodies okay so it has a lot of neural cell bodies in there okay and that is why we are going to have what we call that portion is called the gray matter gray matter now this gray matter consists of roughly 40 percent of the brain okay and that is very important in serving as a processing center of information okay processing center of information and it usually get fully developed once a person reaches uh, you know his or her 20s okay that's when it gets fully developed now the remaining 60 percent okay of what we call the cerebral hemisphere will be what you call the white matter okay that's the inner portion the white matter because it has a lot of you know uh, myelinated axons okay nerve fibers in there so that's why we're going to have that one to contribute that's the 60 percent that is contributed by it and it allows communication to and from gray matter areas right in between the gray matter and the other parts of the body so if there's that could be that communication then it's via this kind of white matter but usually what happens is that it develops throughout you know the a20s but it peaks around middle each. so uh, that is what uh, we have to actually see now there are other things although we are talking about you know white matter gray matter we are saying that gray matter yes as you can see over here will be found at the periphery of the cerebral hemisphere then within it will be white matter but sometimes yes not sometimes yeah there are there are areas of masses of gray matter which are found deep in the white matter and they are actually going to be found between now this is the thalamus usually found between the thalamus and the white matter okay that's where you are actually going to find them and these ones are known as uh, what we call basal nuclei so basal nuclei are nothing but gray matter that we find embedded within white matter of the brain now some people call it you know basal ganglia but what happens that you know usually if we talk about ganglia we are talking about you know peripheral nervous system so the correct name is basal nuclei so a similar would be basal nucleus okay so examples yeah there are actually about five of them 
of these uh, uh what do you call it basal nuclei yes one of them is over here being the chordate nucleus yes now all these things we are making mention of you actually going to apply them there's just an overview for you to get i mean uh, uh, appreciate whatever is happening within the nervous system now we have what you call the chordate nucleus okay and then we also have the uh, putamen okay we also have the putamen which is over there then we also have what you call globus pallidus globus pallidus okay these ones are very important aspects okay three of them that we see here but even apart from that we have what we call substantia nigra as well as subthalamic nucleus so we actually have five basal nuclei five basal nuclei and what they are going to do is that they are going to help in control of voluntary movement now, one other thing too, which is very important as far as the brain is concerned, is for us to talk about the limbic system. Okay, we will talk about all these things in greater detail, but we have what we call limbic system. Now, limbic system has three components, and these are what we call the hypothalamus, which is part of what we call the diencephalon. Okay, so here is the thalamus. Yes, beneath the thalamus, we are going to have the hypothalamus. Okay, or let me say anterior inferiorly to what we call the thalamus, we are going to have the hypothalamus. And then, apart from that, we are going to have what we call the hippocampus, as well as what we call the amygdala. Okay, so, uh, uh, sorry. Now, we have what we call the hypothalamus. Yes, we've seen that. Sorry, here is it, hypothalamus. Then we are going to have what we call the hippocampus, and then we're going to have what is called the amygdala. So, amygdala is cranial to what we call the hippocampus. So what we see is that, yes, if you take the hippocampus, it will be very important in what we call emotions, okay, as well as learning and memory, okay, hippocampus. Because you can see, you know, there's some kind of campus in there, then you don't, yes, learn and memory will have to come in. And then, you know, the next one is amygdala. Yes, amygdala will be very important in aggression, in eating, you know, drinking, as well as sexual, you know, behaviors, amygdala. And of course, hypothalamus, as we've already seen, is very important in homeostasis, in tests, in hunger, you know, regulating all these things, you know, sex, even birth, you know, all those ones will be controlled, as well as secreting some kind of hormones. Now, we've seen that the brain is going to have left and right hemispheres, and within each hemisphere, there will be several areas, there will be several loops, as well as convolutions, which we call them gyri. Then one thing is that, yes, then of course, we have other areas which are below, other areas which are above. Okay, I told you that the thalamus will be very important relay center between structures which are below and structures which are above. And that is why there should be some kind of fibers which you have to connect various areas of the brain. And those fibers, you know, we classify them into three. We have one of them is called association fibers. Now, I will show you the association fibers. I have a slide to show that. Association fibers, okay? So, what association fibers will be doing is that they are going to connect various areas of the brain but within the same hemisphere. Uh, various cortical areas of the brain within the same hemisphere. So, this is an example of an association fiber. We will see other examples, okay? Then, we also have uh, what we call the commissural fibers. Now, commissural fibers will rather connect different areas of different cerebral hemispheres in fact it could be the same area or different areas of different cerebral hemispheres okay so what will happen is that yes there's an area of this brain there's uh, there's a right hemisphere there's a left hemisphere they are connected via this i mean commercial fiber okay and the largest commercial fiber that you have in the human body is known as corpus callosum corpus callosum over here then we may also have um, now even apart from that i'll show you other you know commercial fibers you know we'll talk about anterior commercial posterior commercial having no left commercials yes there are the examples of you know the uh, uh what you call commercial fibers and then we also have what you call projection fibers so for projection fibers they move up and down okay so what we have is that projection fibers will contain both afferent fibers, okay, as well as efferent fibers. So I told you that afferent fibers, they will be carrying impulses, okay, to the cerebral cortex. So they will be carrying it this way, moving in this manner, okay, to the cerebral cortex. Then also sending those, uh, I mean, 
commands away from the cerebral cortex to lower portions of the brain and beyond will be through what we call the efferent fibers. So what we have to know is that these are projection. They project mm, up and down the brain. And that is what we call projection fibers. Okay. So what they do is that they are going to connect cerebral cortex with subcortical gray matter of you know the basal ganglia you know apart from that you know thalamus brainstem and of course the spinal cord spinal cord we will get to know there will be other areas yes uh, uh, you know we, they also form something you call corona radiata as they give off some radiations over here the projection fibers as well as even they give off some kind of screws cerebri mm -hmm. they give off some kind of screw cerebri there's that kind of decreasation, forming that kind of cross, so cruise cerebri. So these are the things that we are talking about, that there are going to be three fibers, which will connect different areas of the brain. Those ones which are connecting the same area, different areas of the brain, but within the same hemisphere, is known as association fibers. Those ones which are going to connect, you know, different cerebral hemispheres, or connect the cerebral hemispheres, will be known as commissural fibers. And those ones which are going to project more or less vertically, okay, connecting various areas above and below the cerebral, sorry, uh, I mean, yeah, yes, various areas above and below the thalamus, yes, will be called what we call uh, projection fibers. So I want to actually take a closer look at this. Now, look at this. Now, this over here is actually what we call the corpus callosum. Now, there's a sagittal section showing you the corpus callosum this one the corpus callosum is the largest commercial fiber it's going to have a body it's going to have what we call the genu okay as if it's uh, angulated here that's the genu and then it's going to have the most cranial portion being the rostrum okay being a rostrum then the most posterior portion being the splenium okay so we have to know the splenium the most posterior portion then you have the body you have the genu and of course you have the rostrum Forming part, we will see all these ones in greater detail. Okay, later. Then we also have some examples of association fibers, which let me just mention a few. Yes, short fibers, superior, you know, longitudinal fibers, you know, cingulum just above where we have the corpus callosum. Yeah, the one uh, you know, fasciculus, or uh, then you have inferior longitudinal. I mean. Uh, fasciculus okay so one thing that you have to know is that this one the association fibers they are connecting the same uh, cerebral uh, areas uh, cortical areas within the same cerebral hemisphere now have you seen one thing that you have to know is that the main important area where consciousness is perceived okay the seat of consciousness is known as the cerebral cortex okay the outermost portion of the brain cerebral cortex and this one, yes, is having you know, surface layer of gray matter. Yes, that is going to be a gray matter, roughly three millimeters in thickness. Okay, and then to have what we call the new cortex or the new cortex having about six layers, and that forms about ninety percent of the cortex. Okay, and then that's the newest part of the cortex, that's the paleo cortex and the archi cortex. Okay, and the layers vary in thickness in different regions of the brain so i'm actually going to show you that now in this slide what i want to show you is that if you look at the seat of consciousness being the cerebral cortex having this new cortex this new cortex this new cortex is having six layers and within the six, six layers there are two cell types which you are going to find them there in any case not in all the layers and these two cell types are going to be the stellar cells and the pyramidal cells now stellar cells yes the name suggests what the shape is like star shaped so to speak and because they are star shaped you have a lot of dendrites dendritic processes coming out of it so you can see those cells with a lot of dendrites they are the stellar cells then we have another type of cell which we call it pyramidal so triangular pyramidal in shape so to speak and those one will have an axon that passes out of the area into the white matter so it is moving all the way from the gray matter even into the white matter so moving out all the way even away from the cerebral cortex okay so those ones with a very you know for instance this having a very long axon yes moving into what we call the i mean white matter we call it uh the uh, i mean what you call pyramidal 
cell. So there are two cell types which are going to see in the cerebral cortex, the seat of in, um, consciousness. And these two cell types are the stellate cells, star-shaped, having a lot of processes, a lot of dendritic processes, and then the pyramidal-shaped cells having, you know, very long axons, which can reach, you know, the, uh, uh, what do you call, white matter. So the six layers, schematically, we want to see them. And these six layers are, yes, the la first layer is called the molecular layer, molecular layer. Okay, so this is the molecular layer. Layer one is called molecular layer. And one thing about the molecular layer is that, yes, what we are going to see is that you see axons and dendrites. So we are going to see, yes, axons as well as dendrites. These are the two main components we are going to see in the molecular layer. And one thing is that by way of the afferent pathway, what happens is that it carries or it is from other regions of the cortex and the brainstem. So the cortical area itself, okay, as well as the brainstem, okay, and then two, or with respect to the efferent aspect, okay, so carry two regions of the cortex, okay. So there's some kind of association fibers over there, which is doing all these things. So intracortical association functions, okay. So molecular layer, axons and dendrites are the components, okay. So you can see the axon, as well as the dendrite, dendritic processes will be there, and then we are going to say that it is from, by way of afferent, it is from other areas of the cortex as well as the brainstem. Okay, other areas of the cortex as well as the brainstem. When I talk about brainstem, I don't need to tell you that I'm talking about the midbrain. I'm talking about the pons as well as the medulla oblongata. And then two, other areas of the cortex, other areas. So from other cortical areas to other areas of the cortex. And that's why we talk about the intracortical association. Association fibers doing that. Now the second layer is known as the external granular layer. External granular layer. Okay. So we are going. To, so from external to internal, we have the molecular layer, external granular layer. Now this external granular layer, yes, will contain densely packed. Okay, densely packed stellate cells, star-shaped cells. So this, this is the schematic representation. Densely packed star-shaped cells, as well as yes, of course, densely packed small pyramidal cells as well as you know these densely packed small pyramidal cells and that is why because of the presence of these small pyramidal cells we call this second layer or the external granular layer you know the small pyramidal cell layer small pyramidal cell layer okay and that one too is from other regions of the cortex and the brainstem to of course uh, other regions of the cortex that kind of intra cortical association function taking place there once again then we have the third layer. So from external granular, we go to external pyramidal, okay, layer. So it means that the key cell over there will be these pyramidal cells. But you can see that these pyramidal cells are larger than the previous ones that we've seen, okay. So these are medium-sized pyramidal cells, and that is why we call the third layer or the external pyramidal layer the medium, I mean, pyramidal layer or medium pyramidal cell layer. Okay, so what you see is that because these pyramidal cells are very large, they don't tend to have that kind of compact nature as we saw in the case of the, I mean, external granular layer. So the external pyramidal layer or the medium sized pyramidal layer cell will contain medium pyramidal cells, okay, with loosely packed stellate cells. So loosely packed stellate cells also embedded within it. That one is also coming from, yes, other regions of the cortex as well as the brainstem, okay, to of course, you know, other regions of the cortex. Then we also have what we call the fourth layer is the internal granular layer. We've seen the external granular layer, external pyramidal layer. So the next one is internal granular layer. Now the internal granular layer, yes, will consist of densely packed stellate cells only. So the keyword, the fourth layer, you find only stellate cells. Fourth layer, only stellate cells, densely packed, as you can see over here. And it's also coming from other regions of the cortex and the brainstem, and more importantly, also coming from the thalamus. Mm? Also coming from the thalamus. There are no efferents, okay, for the I mean fourth granular layer. Then for actually the fifth layer, the fifth layer we call the internal pyramidal layer. But this cell you find only large pyramidal cells. You find only large pyramidal cells. 
okay there are no you can see that there are no stellate cells so what you can remember is that the fourth layer you have only stellate cells the fifth layer you have only pyramidal cells but this only pyramidal cells are larger than previously i mean pyramidal cells previous pyramidal cells that we've seen and therefore that is why this fifth layer is also referred to as large pyramidal cell layer large pyramidal cell layer and by way of afferent from of course the brain stem okay of course you know the midbrain pons and middle oblongata to of course the brain stem once again and spinal cord so it's going to be via what you call some projection fibers unlike the association fibers that we've seen in the case of the first three layers of the cerebral cortex you know the fifth layer okay will be via projection fibers and then we also have the sixth layer and the sixth layer is what we call the multiform or we could also call the polyform layer so there's that kind of different shapes so different shapes that's why we call it polyform or multiform and those are have multiple sized pyramidal cells okay with you know loosely packed stellar cells also in between them so we have different small pyramidal cells medium sized large pyramidal cells with stellar cells also embedded within it and by way of efferent there are no afferent efferent to the thalamus so this one you have to actually understand this okay very well now one key thing is that yes apart from you know uh, bony pro protection apart from meninges one other thing which will also be very important uh, in protection by way of shock absorption by way of giving nourishment as well as removing waste will be csf cerebral spinal fluid so we want to actually go through how cerebral spinal fluid you know flows uh, we will look at the various you know ventricles in detail okay look at ventricles of the brain in detail but one thing is that now the first point is that now just below so forming the roof of what we call the lateral ventricle over here is the corpus callosum so over here we are in the lateral ventricle the brain has four ventricles two lateral ventricles a third ventricle okay and then of course a fourth ventricle so we are looking at the lateral ventricle so we say that csf will be secreted now in the floor of the lateral ventricle there are some granulations over there we call them choroid plexus choroid plexus now these choroid plexus are important in producing what we call csf so we say that csf will be secreted by what you call the choroid plexus now within the lateral ventricle and i don't need to tell you that the lateral ventricle will be located in of course the you know the uh telencephalon okay telencephalon now what happens is that yes then that csf will flow through some kind of foramen okay now because we are going to have two lateral ventricles then there will be two foramina so those foramina will be called interventricular foramina interventricular foramina of monroe so it flows into it so that it gets into what we call the third ventricle now within the third ventricle there is still choroid plexus so the choroid plexus will still continue the secretion of csf to add on to it and then from there that csf will flow into the fourth ventricle but this time around it flows through you know a channel which you call it aqueduct of sylvius aqueduct of sylvius okay so through the aqueduct of sylvius okay it flows through it and then it gets into what we call the um, what we call the fourth ventricle but remember that the third ventricle Will be located in the diencephalon okay diencephalon that's where the third ventricle will be located so we come into i mean the fourth ventricle via the aqueduct of sylvius and then within the fourth ventricle yes once again we also have some choroid plexus being there to add on to the csf that we already produced okay so that is what we are going to see now remember that if you take uh, this uh what do you call it fourth ventricle Fourth ventricle is between the telencephalon, where we're going to have uh, what we call the cerebellum, as well as, of course, you know, the pons is in between, largely between these two. Okay, that's where you are going to see it. So over there, apart, ap apart from producing it, then there are other channels that I have to run through, live through it. It will live through what we call a median aperture and two lateral apertures. 
okay it will live through what we call i mean a median aperture and two lateral i mean apertures now when it leaves then what will happen is that uh, the csf now fills okay now the csf now fills an area which is below the arachnoid matter which you call the subarachnoid space okay so that i can you know bath the external aspect of the brain as well as even the spinal cord okay the brain as well as even the spinal cord now over there what will happen is that we have what you call arachnoid villi okay within the subarachnoid space we have arachnoid villi and the arachnoid villi what they are going to do is that they are going to help you know resorb so to speak they are going to absorb but we are using the word resorb okay into the venous system this kind of csf so one important venous sinus which we find in the sagittal section of the head region is what we call the superior sagittal sinus it takes it in there so that it gets into i mean systemic circulation it gets into systemic circulation so that is what i mean we have regarding the flow of csf so just know csf starting in the lateral ventricle into of course the third ventricle via interventricular foramen of monroe from third ventricle into fourth ventricle via what we call aqueduct of sylvius from uh, i mean fourth ventricle into median and lateral you know apertures then eventually into the subarachnoid space will be resorbed by what you call the arachnoid villi then of course into the superior sagittal sinus one of the dural venous sinuses now one important thing is that with respect to i mean csf production if there is i mean uh, the drainage of csf is not efficient or if it is overproduced then it will lead to swelling okay of the brain why will the brain swell because of course the ventricles will be filled with extra csf fluid okay and that condition is what we call hydrocephalus now talking about the protection we've seen one of them being the csf very important but then the external aspect of the brain absorbing shock and all that yes we also have what we call the meninges now meninges we are going to have three of them and these three meninges yes from uh, just away from the i mean the cranium okay to the inner portion or to the external aspect of the brain we are going to have what you call i mean the dura mater we are going to have the arachnoid mater and the pia mater and the dura mater you know can also be called pachy meninges okay so the pachy meninges okay is what we call the dura mater pachy meninges is the dura mater and it's actually made of fibrous components and it's actually in a inextensible it's inelastic so to speak okay and what it's going to do is that yes it forms that kind of sheet or false that separate the cerebrum and you know cerebellum into the hemispheres and of course the i mean cerebellum from the cerebrum okay so we see some nice false cerebelli false cerebri those ones are coming from modifications of what we call the i mean the dura matter now usually those ones which are found on the brain okay the dura matter which you find i mean surrounding the brain okay it's going to have two layers okay but that surrounding the spinal cord will have just a single layer those surrounding the brain will have two layers an outer layer which you call the endosteal layer and of course the inner meningeal layer proper okay and then we're going to have what we call the arachnoid matter the arachnoid matter being the second layer as well as the pia matter together we call them lepto meninges lepto meninges so lepto meninges is nothing but arachnoid matter and pia matter now arachnoid matter which is a middle layer gives this kind of spider web appearance and that's why we call arachnoid matter you go you know the word arachno how to do it you know either the spider you know arachnophobia spear fear spider so this kind of spider web appearance makes it i mean be called you know arachnoid matter then the inner one which is made of loose connective tube very thin okay rich in a lot of blood vessels is known as pia matter pia matter pia matter so pia matter just lies and it's having this kind of convolutions the contours or that gyri nature of the brain yes it follows the same gyri and it's just rich in a lot of blood vessels now talking about these meninges there are some areas or spaces that we find around these meninges 
and these many areas or spaces are one sub arachnoid space now the word sub means below so sub means yes it's going to be found below what we call the uh the okay so it does the arachnoid matter so below the arachnoid matter will be a space and that space is called sub arachnoid space and therefore we can also say that is that space which will be between the arachnoid matter and the pyre matter and then we also have what you call a subdural space so we saw the dura matter very durable and below it before you get into the arachnoid matter we are going to have another space and that space is what we call subdural matter subdural matter okay so that is what uh, we are going to see and then we are going to have what you call epidural space epidural now the word epi means above okay epidural space so there will be another space which will be found above you know what we call the uh what we call i mean the dura matter okay so that space will be actually be found between the dura matter and vertebral canal okay in the spinal column and that is what we call the epidural space remember csf will be running in the subarachnoid space okay subarachnoid space now let's look briefly into what the spinal cord is about yes the spinal cord will be protected yes by of course the uh, bones of the vertebrae apart from that of course csf will do that as well as even the meninges okay will help you know doing that kind of protection to it now if you take the spinal cord roughly 45 centimeters long yes ending around somewhere you know l2 vertebral level okay so it's actually going to begin in the cervical just continuation of what we call the medulla oblongata in the neck region so we have the cervical component and we have an area of the cervical region which presents an enlargement over here we have cervical enlargement then we have the thoracic component then we have the lumbar component okay which will end in a cone like structure which we call the medullary cone and then you have the you have the sacral components okay ending the medullary cone and then the remaining portion forming that kind of uh we have the phylum terminalis and of course you know you have the corda equina like the horse's tail okay so that's what we have now one thing that you have to know is that there will be another enlargement in the lumbosacral region or in the lumbar region apart from the cervical enlargement there will be another enlargement and that's why if you take these cross sections you can see that in the cervical region showing this kind of enlargement this one also showing that kind of enlargement over here so one thing is that there will be some kind of nerves i told you that there will be nerves leaving these areas brain as well as spinal cord so the nerves coming from the i mean spinal cord they are the spinal nerves so those ones emerging from the level of the neck region will be called cervical nerves and surprisingly, we are going to have eight of them, C1 to C8. Unlike we are having seven bones of a vertebrae, cervical nerves will be eight, C1 to C8. And then for the thoracic nerves, they will be T1 to T12. That one, no problem. Then, of course, um, for the lumbar region, yes, that one is also five. That's L1 to L5, okay, in that manner, leaving those kind of... Uh, intervertebral you know foramina over there then we also have uh the sacral components okay for the sacral component we are going to have s1 to s5 okay that one also come out um then we also have what we call the coxygeal parts okay also come out and then we also have the portion which you call the phylum terminalis okay phylum terminalis now all these ones that you see this kind of um horse tail like appearance that you find over here is known as the corda equina corda equina so that is generally how the spinal cord you know looks like and remember you see the spinal cord follows the curvatures of what we call the vertebral column okay having those kind of secondary curvatures primary curvatures over there so we've seen those ones okay now remember that the spinal cord will be very important in conducting you know afferent stimuli okay bringing those ones through the sensory i mean i mean you know through the sensory pathway afferent okay to eventually to the brain and it also conducts that kind of you know efferent stimuli okay coming from you know the brain to the effectors and when i talk about the effectors i'm talking about you know the glands secreting as well as the muscles contracting and they also be very important in initial i mean integration of reflexes you know reflexes uh they are that kind of um 
you know uh, immediate and automatic response okay that one initiates okay and it's very important these kind of reflexes reflex actions to work here along the short part we call them reflex acts okay so that yes it helps to protect the subject from further injury and, you know examples blinking of the eye you know after touching you know fire or getting uh, let's say pin uh, let's say getting pricked by a pin then you quickly remove you know talk about the knee reflexes all those ones will be taking place you know along where you have the spinal cord now this one uh, i'm just going to show you something we'll go to a greater detail of it later but one thing over here is that if you take you know a cross section through what we call the spinal cord then what will happen is that it's going to bear what we call i mean posteriorly it will bear what you call a sulcus but anteriorly, it will bear what we call a fissure. So the fissure is quite deeper compared to that of the sulcus. So if you have the spinal cord, for you to know the ventral portion as well, the dorsal portion, or for you to know the posterior portion, as well as the anterior portion, just look at the nature of the fissures. Okay, that one will help you to know that. Now, again, one other thing too that you find is that, unlike in the case of the brain, where we had white matter inside, this time around the white matter, okay, inside, inner portion will be gray matter then the outer portion will be white matter and that's the distinction that i have to know regarding the brain and the spinal cord so the gray matter over here form what you call horns okay will form horns now in between the gray matter sorry there's a central canal okay where csf will flow okay in the spinal cord now the gray matter will therefore present with what we call a posterior gray horn or present a posterior horn it also has have a lateral horn and it will have what we call an anterior horn okay so that's what we are going to see regarding this one now one thing too that you have to know is that with the white matter there will be areas which you call them you know fasciculi uh, okay so we see all those ones later or columns so we have what you call yes there will be a posterior column so for instance this is the posterior column there will be a lateral column and there will of course be an anterior column so there will be three columns that we are going to see an anterior column yeah, there will be a posterior column as well as you know lateral columns will be there and we will see all those fasciculi later now one other thing too that we've seen is that we said spinal nerves will be coming out of it but these spinal nerves will actually be formed from what we call yes now we are going to have the one coming from the posterior aspect god is where we have what we call the posterior median sulcus okay this one is known as the posterior root of the spinal nerve so there will be a posterior root and then there will be an anterior root together form what you call the spinal nerve and then the spinal nerve will further divide to give us uh, a posterior ramus and an anterior ramus okay so you see those ones but one thing that we see is that the posterior horn uh, sorry posterior root of the spinal cord will bear you know a ganglion and that is what we call posterior root ganglion or the dorsal root ganglion so we see the other ones okay later now, one other thing too that I have to tell you, very important for you to look at it, is that in the lateral horn, that is where, I mean, there's going to be what autonomic motor neurons, okay, situated over here, and that is a very important relay area, okay, which you will see, a very important where cell bodies of autonomic neurons will be situated. More importantly, the sympathetic neurons, sympathetic neurons, you will see that. So there we are. Now, if you talk about now that's the spinal cord that we've seen, but the spinal cord, yes, I talked about its protection, its protection by way of vertebral column, by way of you know CSF, as well as the meninges. So the meninges is just like that we find in the case of the brain. Only that this time around, instead of the dura mater having, I mean, two layers, having the endosteral layer, as well as of course the meningeal layer proper, this one is just having a single layer. Okay, so that is what uh, I want you to know. Okay, so just like any other, if you take the dura matter, you are going to have arachnoid matter, and then of course the pia matter, and of course you know between the arachnoid matter will be an, and the pia matter will be an, a subarachnoid space, of course where CSF will have to flow. But one thing to is that now look at this. Now you see this ligament, which we call denticulate ligament, or you simply call the dentate ligament. And in this dentate ligament, you can see now there's the spinal cord. Okay. Now and then we have the uh, what we call the 
dura mater. Now the dentate ligament or the denticular ligament is very important in anchoring. Okay, in anchoring what you call uh, the spinal cord to the dura mater on either side. So in other areas, yeah, that's what we are going to see. So that's the denticular ligament or the dentate ligament. Now, yes, we want to look at some kind of distinction between, yes, in this tabular form, between, of course, the uh, meninges that we find, okay, surrounding the brain and meninges surrounding the spinal cord. So the cranial meninges and the spinal meninges. So by way of differences, yes, then one key thing is that, yes, it is going to mainly surround, of course, you know, the brain. In the case of cranial meninges, spinal meninges, the spinal cord, yes. So mainly surround the skull, in the case of cranial meninges, and of course a prolongation from the skull all the way to the S2 vertebral level. And then one other thing is that in the cranial meninges, it may not produce an epidural space. I'm not saying it's not going to produce, it may not produce. So for instance, those ones that we saw, we didn't see an epidural space, but almost always we will find an epidural space in the case of the spinal meninges. And that one will contain, you know, some kind of fats, okay, in there. And then I told you that the cranial meninges will contain two layers of the dura mater, industrial layer, and of course, uh, you know, meningeal layer proper. And then in the case of the spinal meninges, it will contain a single layer. Then for um, the cranial meninges, they make folds in the dura mater between various parts of the brain. Okay, then dura mater forms a dura sheet. Okay, that just a dura sheet that it forms. Then what happens again is that may do not contain a subdura space. Yes, we didn't see a subdura space in the case of uh, what you call the cranial meninges, but you you find that one in the case of the spinal meninges. Okay, and then we are saying that yes, the cranial meninges will contain arachnoid trabeculae in the subarachnoid space. But in the case of what we call the spinal meninges, will contain arachnoid trabeculae condensed into posterior median septum. It is condensed with posterior median septum. So these are some distinctions between, of course, the meninges we find in the case surrounding the brain and the meninges surrounding the spinal cord. Now, an important aspect which we have to really look at is for us to know the neuron. Now, the neuron is the excitable cell in the nervous system okay very important as far as far as you know uh, conduction of impulses okay will be concerned now if you take the neuron what happens is that the neuron presents with two main components we have what you call a cell body okay and processes we have a cell body and process the cell body is also called soma so the soma is actually made up of its cytoplasm as well as the nucleus and of course you know the nucleus will contain the nucleus okay and then the cytoplasm within the cytoplasm an important aspect which you have to know yes will be that it will contain some substance we call nestle bodies and these nestle bodies are actually the granula or the rough endoplasmic column as well as even some free ribosomes they form what we call the nestle bodies but one thing that you have to know is that an area which is getting close to initi initiation, initial portion of the axon, which we will look at later, which you have sparse distribution of these nestle bodies, okay, is known as the axonal hillock. Axonal hillock. So axonal hillock, you may not really see these kind of nestle bodies, okay. So that is what you have to see. So this uh, axonal hillock will connect, of course, you know, the soma to, of course, the axon to the axon. Now, one thing that you have to know here is that uh, if now the cell membrane of the cell body of or the soma of this neuron is modified to give these processes. Now, there are two main processes which you have to know, and these two main processes are the dendrites, this forming this kind of tree like appearance over here, are the dendrites and another process which you call the axon modification of the cell membrane of the you know the soma okay so this one the dendrites will be where the impulses they will be receptive so to speak they will receive the impulses and then the carrying the impulses away from the soma will be by the axon 
Okay, so that's what we see. So, but one other thing too is that there could be some other things. Now, on the axon, there could be some kind of varicosities or certain things we call them boutons. And these are actually nothing but knob like enlargements. Okay, that you find them, you know, usually at the axonal ends. Okay, and that area will be important area where synapses can be formed with other neurons. Now, when I talk about synapses, what you have to know is that the synapses will occur between dendrite and dendrite. Okay, dendritic, dendritic, you know, synapse. It could also be between an axon and dendrite, azodendritic. It could be an axon and another axon, azoazonal. Okay, so we can have several of these that kind of uh, synapses taking place. Okay, so that is what we are going to see. Now, other things you find in the cytoplasm, yes, will be, of course, you know, the mitochondria will be there, you know, as well as even some kind of neurofilaments will also be there. Okay, so that is what uh, you have to know. Now, with respect to the number of processes, okay, so I'm talking about modification of the cell membrane of the cytoplasm, sorry, uh, cell membrane of the soma of the, the neuron. If we are talking about that, then we can distinguish structurally, okay, the number of processes which comes out directly from the soma, the cell membrane of the soma, can therefore give us two kinds of neurons by way of structure. And it's by way, the first one, yes, is known as bipolar neuron. The word is bi, bi means two. It means that there will be two processes which will be extending from the cell membrane of what we call the soma, the body. So you can see that this is the soma. There's one process coming out this way. There's another process coming out this way. Now, these are other processes, but they are not coming directly from the soma. And therefore, we say this neuron is a bipolar neuron. Bipolar neuron. Okay, so we find some in the case of retinal cells, you know, factory cells. We see other examples. Then the next neuron, now usually, the bipolar neurons will be sensory. Usually by our function, functionally, they will be sensory in nature. Now, for the multipolar polar neurons, which are usually motor in nature, they will have several, you know, processes coming out from the body. Now, so this is the cell body. You can see there's, an, there's one process here, another one, another one, another one. So several processes coming out from the body. That is a multipolar neuron. And you can see examples like, you know, spinal motor neuron, pyramidal neuron, pecking cells. We see that. Now, there's another neuron, which you call it pseudo unipolar neuron. Now, the reason why you are calling it pseudo unipolar neuron is that developmentally, it was a bipolar neuron, but it became, you know, unipolar, so to speak. Therefore, it is going to have a single process emerging from its cell body, cell membrane of the cell body. Okay, so you can see that this one and just one process coming out, which will further divide to give several processes. So, this is a pseudo unipolar neuron, or you can also call it the a unipolar you know, neuron. An example is seen in the case of the dorsal or posterior root ganglion, okay, coming from this of the spinal cord. Then, of course, we can also see other examples, you know, most of the cranial nerve ganglia. You may see them there coming from talking about the uh, trigeminal ganglia, talking about geniculate ganglia. Yes, all those ones are examples. So, so this table actually summarizes what we are talking about by way of structure. We are going to have pseudo unipolar neuron. Example is the cranial nerve ganglia, as well as most of the cranial nerve ganglia. Yes. Then we also have the bipolar neuron, seen in the case of retina or factory epithelium, vestibular ganglion. Yes, of the ear, rating the ear. Then auditory or spiral ganglion. Then we also have the multipolar neuron. The multipolar neuron. We are going to see example like stilates, okay, uh, in the case star shape, you know, fusiform, you know, pyramidal one, most of them find themselves in the CNS, you know, pyramidal, uh, there's piriform, pyramidal one seen in the hippocampus, as well as second, third, fifth, and then of course, you know, the sixth layer of the uh, cerebral cortex that we've already seen, as Purkinje, yes, fibers, you know, mitral cells, you know, chandelier, yes, granule, and amicrine cells, yes, uh, we see all those ones. So for us, amicrine cells, we see them in the retina, granule, cerebral, and cerebral cortex, you know, chandelier in the visual areas of cerebral cortex. You know, the mitral one seen in the olfactory bulb, you know, Purkinje, 
in what we call cerebral cortex. Now later we'll go into greater detail of all these ones. But by way of function, the neurons will be classified into three. We have the sensory neuron, which will carry impulses, okay? Okay, in this direction, okay, afferent, so through the afferent pathway. And then we also have what you call the relay neuron or the interneuron or the association neurons, which will connect, okay, neurons to each other, to themselves, actually. Then, of course, we also have the motor neuron through the efferent pathway, okay, in that manner. So that is how they do it. Yes, carrying sensory impulses through the afferent pathway will be the sensory neuron. You know, connecting the neurons will be the interneuron. Then relaying that kind of impulses to motor, uh, motor, uh, uh, what do you call it, muscles to muscles or to glands for, you know, appropriate action will be via what you call the motor neuron through the efferent pathway. Now, so what are we saying? In general, what we are saying is that we are going to have some receptors, okay? So for instance, there will be the receptors in the skin. Okay, so there will be nerve, sensory nerve endings within the skin. So if there's a, uh, some kind of heat, uh, changes in temperature, whatever, it will be sensed by those sensory nerve endings within the skin, for instance. And these ones will be carried. So we follow the, I mean, the Kesa to be carried all the way. All the way. So true. So the stimulus should be enough, okay, to generate this kind of, uh, I mean, this kind of impulse or transmission of this impulse. So action potential in the sensory as well. Okay, so the action potential will ensure the propagation of this kind of uh, sensory impulse all the way, okay, until you get into, of course, the spinal cord and then the brain, where there's going to be something we call the sensory axon, okay, will enter the spinal cord and will synapse, you know, with other nerves within the brain. Those nerves will be called interneuron. So there will be an interneuron which will be connected to the sensory neuron which came and then from there, yes, there will be sensory pathway continues in what we call the second neuron projecting to the thalamus. I told you that the thalamus will be a very important relay area, okay, so that it relays that information, sensory information, to higher portions of the brain, actually in the cerebral cortex. I told you that the cerebral cortex is the seat of consciousness. So a sensory pathway reaches the cerebral cortex for conscious perception. Okay, so that's how it it is. Then, you know, through uh, that kind of previous experience, appropriate, pre appropriate processing will take place within the cerebral cortex, and then the appropriate action will be sent. The output will have to be sent through a neuron within the brain, which we call upper motor neuron, upper motor neuron. And then for upper motor neuron within the spinal cord, we also have another neuron, which we call it a lower motor neuron. So it relays in there, in the spinal cord, through uh, and gives it to what we call a motor, a lower motor, uh, a lower motor neuron. And then from lower motor neuron, yes, all the way it comes, okay, into the lower motor. Uh, what do you call it? It affects a particular muscle. So for instance, the lower motor neuron causes contraction of the target skeletal muscle of the target skeletal muscle. So if it's a gland then a particular gland will secrete. So that is how generally the afferent pathway goes through the sensory pathway, then the efferent pathway through the motor pathway. Okay, that's how it goes. Now, even having talking about neurons, now one thing is that we may have one, you know, motor neuron actually innervating several, you know, muscles. So that kind of... Uh, collection between one single motor neuron innervating several groups of muscles will form something we call a motor unit motor unit so talking about motor units then it's very important that we explain these concepts now the first one is multiple motor unit summation multiple motor unit summation so that's why we say when a lot of motor units are recruited so several motor units recruited the muscle contracts with greater force, no doubt. And this one allows the individual muscle fibers to contract in an all or none manner while the overall muscle contracts with different amounts of force. Okay, so it depends on the nerve stimulus involved. So with this multiple, multi, uh, multiple motor unit summation will help in greater, you know, muscle contraction. Now remember, muscle contraction work in an all or none phenomenon. 
okay because an inhibitor muscle fiber contracts with equal force in response to each action potential so action potential is needed okay for uh, what do you call it should reach a particular threshold okay for the uh, muscle contraction to okay if that threshold is not rich then no muscle contraction occurs so we have a sub threshold stimulus okay that one is too small to create an action potential in the neuron and therefore that muscle will not contract now we also have what you call threshold stimulus okay so threshold stimulus is similar way is strong enough to create an action potential in the neuron that's threshold so it has raised you know the threshold i mean stimulus then we also have a submaximal stimulus okay that stimuli of increasing strength that create more action potential along more neurons that's sub you know maximal you know stimuli then we also have maximal stimuli you know where stimulus uh, which is strong enough to create an action potential in an all in all the motor neurons innervating the whole muscle so these are some areas some aspects that i mean we have to actually understand that if a muscle will have to contract then you know there should be the action potential should be enough for that muscle to contract if this below the level then it won't contract at all if it is enough then it will contract so it's working in an all or none phenomenon now having seen the neuron now one other thing which is also part of the cells in the nervous system although that's not excitable and those cells will help in protection, help in insulation, help in feeding, you know, repair and all that. Okay. And those cells are referred to as neuroglar cells or simply we call them glial cells. And these glial cells, we can divide them broadly into two. Okay. And these cells, we are having those ones which are coming from the central nervous system and those ones which are going to help the peripheral nervous system, so to speak. Those ones coming from the central nervous system are four, and these ones are astrocytes, ependymal cells, oligodendrocytes, and microglial cells. And then those coming from the peripheral nervous system are the satellite cells and the Schwann cells. Now, the astrocytes are very important in maintaining what we call the blood-brain barrier. Okay, you know, the brain uh, cells were not introduced to the you know immune system during development, and therefore any portion antigens coming from the brain getting into the blood will elicit that kind of immune response autoimmune distraction okay and that's why you know the brain will have to uh be separated from blood okay through this blood brain barrier okay and it's contributed by astrocytes now it also provides structural support regulates ion nutrient and dissolved gas concentrations helps absorb and recycle you know neurotransmitters okay very important and also form scar tissue after injury so these ones will be by the functions of astrocytes of the cns then we have the ependymal cells now the ependymal cells or the pendyma they line ventricles of the brain remember the ventricles we had two lateral ventricles a third ventricle and a fourth ventricle as well as the central canal of the spinal cord by so doing it assists okay or these cells assist in producing circulating and monitoring the CSF. They also contribute to CSF formation. Then we also have what we call the oligodendrocytes. Now for the oligodendrocytes, then what they are going to do is that uh, they are going to myelinate the CNS as ones, okay, so that it can provide that kind of structural framework. You know, whenever we insulate, okay, so oligodendrocytes are very important in producing what you call myelin sheet in the case of CNS, but you may have a single oligodendrocyte myelinating several, uh, what do you call it, axons of the CNS. But we have another type of cell which does the myelination in the case of PNS, known as Schwann cell. That one, yes, each, uh, I mean, Schwann cell myelinates a particular portion of, you know, the axon of the PNS. So in the case of oligodendrocytes, they are more or less promiscuous. They can myelinate several axons of the CNS, but a single axon will be myelinated by what you call the Schwann cell. Then we also have what we call the microglia. Microglia are actually, you know, the macrophages of the brain. So macrophages of the brain are the microglia, and they will be important in removing debris, okay, you know, engulfing particulate matter, you know, waste and pathogens via, you know, phagocytosis. Now, for the PNS, I've already talked about the Schwann cell. The satellite cells, okay, will be surround neuron cell bodies 
in ganglia and they will help regulate oxygen carbon dioxide nutrients you know and neurotransmitter levels around neurons in the ganglia so these are the supporting cells which you call them the neuroglial cells or the glial cells which you find in the nervous system so there we are now this we have this uh, axon which is highly myelinated you know via the schwann cell it means coming from the pns now myelin sheets okay are produced by these kind of uh, Schwann cells. In the case of PNS and myelin sheet, we produce by oligodendrocyte, as we've seen in CNS. Now, what they do is that they help insulate the axons. Now, apart from doing that, they also help in what we call rapid conduction of impulses, and that's what we call saltatory conduction. So, saltatory conduction to occur, then we need a lot of myelin sheets, okay, so to speak. We need a lot of myelin sheets. Now, Sometimes there could be so it means the more you myelinate an axon, then the larger the diameter. It therefore tells us that the larger the diameter of an axon, then the more uh, the faster it can conduct impulses. So that's one key thing. The faster it can conduct impulses. So you can see this axon is non unmyelinated, but this one is highly you know myelinated. Now, sometimes there could be an autoimmune destruction of these myelin sheets. And that's what it will result in the case of CNS. It will result in something you call multiple sclerosis. Then in the case of PNS, it will result in what you call Guillain bear you know, syndrome. We will see those ones in greater detail later. So there we are. By way of whether the fiber is myelinated or non-myelinated and to what extent the level of myelination we can divide, you know, the nerve fibers into the following. We have the A type, the B type, and the C type. But with the A type, we have alpha, beta, gamma, and delta types. Now, the A up to B types, they are all myelinated. But the extent of myelination actually decreases in that order. Okay, but the C type will be unmyelinated. And that's why, you know, conduction of pain in the C type will be very slow. So let's see. Now the A type of fiber, we have the A alpha, and its function is mainly motor, and its nerve diameter is around 12 to 20. So it means it's highly myelinated. Look at the speed of conduction, having the highest speed of conduction because it's myelinated. Then it will be followed by A beta. Okay, A beta is mainly for touch pressure via what you call cutaneous skin mechanoreceptors. Okay, and those one the diameter maximum up to about 12 and then speed of conduction up to about 70, you know, millisecond. You know, it's myelinated but less myelinated compared to that of the A alpha. Then A gamma will be, its function will be muscle spindle afferents. Okay, muscle spindle afferents. Its diameter is up to about 6 millimeters. And its speed of conduction up to about 30. So as you come down, it decreases. Then we have the A delta. A delta is fast pain as well as temperature, fast pain in temperature. And that one maximum up to about five millimeters, about 30. Yes. And that one, yes, also its speed of conduction roughly the same as that in the case of A gamma. Then for the B, yes, B, you have to know it is actually for autonomic preganglionic neurons. B fibers are seen in the case of autonomic preganglionic neurons. And those ones, yes, less than 3, up to about 15. Yes, also myelinated, but less myelinated, actually. Then for C fibers, slow pain, you know, usually in the case of the postganglionic, okay, post autonomic postganglionic neurons, we see that. And that one, yes, you can see the speed. The speed is just about 2 milliseconds. And that one, because it is unmyelinated. Okay, so please try and get this table. Very important. Now, one thing that we have to know, yes, having mentioned these kind of neurons, then we have to know that we are going to have, in the case of autonomic nervous system, okay, or the autonomous nervous system, we are going to have what you call a preganglionic neuron, and we're going to have what you call a postganglionic neuron. So, for instance, now you can see, assuming there's the uh, lateral column, sorry, lateral horn of the spinal cord. Yes, we are going to have this kind of neuron which is emerging out. And this neuron will be called a preganglionic neuron. 
preganglionic neuron. And we've already seen that preganglionic autonomic neurons are the type B fibers. I'm going to have the type B fibers. We've already seen that. And there's going to be that kind of synapse in an autonomic ganglion. Okay, so that I can have a post ganglion. But before the synapse, what happens is that the preganglion neuron will have to release its neurotransmitter. Now, the neurotransmitter of the pre, coming from the preganglion neuron, irrespective of whether it is coming from sympathetic or parasympathetic, will be acetylcholine. Will be acetylcholine. And then the post ganglionic neuron, yes, can either release acetylcholine in case of parasympathetic or no epinephrine or no adrenaline in case of, you know, um, parasympathetic, uh, sorry, in the case of sympathetic stimulation. Okay, so that it can affect, you know, a target organ. Okay, but one thing that you have to see is that the post ganglionic, you know, autonomic neurons are going to have that kind of C type of fibers. They are all myelinated C type of fibers. Okay, T C type of fibers. That's the key thing. So now, anytime we talk about sympathetic nervous system, Okay, sympathetic nervous is we are talking about the thoracic lumbar outflow and usually start from T1 all the way to T12 together with L1 to L2 or even sometimes L3. So T1 to L2 or T1 to L3 will be the thoracic lumbar outflow. And then, you know, one thing is that it's coming from a lateral horn, which I showed you. And then the parasympathetic nervous system will actually coming from the craniosacral outflow. We we'll have this craniosacral, so coming from the brain. Okay, cranial, and then of course, you know, the spinal cord, the sacral portion of the spinal cord. So those nerves that we call them parasympathetic nerves, okay? Parasympathetic nerves are actually cranial nerve 3, cranial nerve 7, cranial nerve 9, cranial nerve 10, you know, as well as, you know, the sympathetic division, uh, sorry, as well as S2 to what we call S4, okay, spinal nerves. So here we are, yes, I have this parasympathetic nerve. Okay, coming all the way. This is a preganglionic neuron or presynaptic neuron. Now, this is sympathetic presynaptic neuron. Now, one difference is that we will see these ones in greater detail later. But what happens is that the preganglionic neuron of the uh, sympathetic nervous system is longer than in the case of the sympathetic neuron. Then, likewise, sorry, in the other way around, what happens is that the postganglionic neuron, okay, of the parasympathetic is shorter compared to that of the postganglionic neuron of the sympathetic nervous system. I already told you that whether it is parasympathetic or sympathetic, the preganglionic neuron will secrete what we call uh, acetylcholine, acetylcholine. And acetylcholine receptors could be mascarinic or nicotinic, okay? Now, one thing is that, yes, the postganglionic neuron, in the case of parasympathetic, will secrete, you know, acetylcholine to affect the target organ. And of course, for sympathetic, we secret what we call non-epinephrine. Okay. Now, one key thing over here is that for the adrenal medulla, adrenal medulla, you know, adrenal medulla is going to secret epinephrine. Okay. Or it's going to secret adrenaline. Okay. Now, what happens is that we don't have any relay taking place in there. So just the uh, the autonomic neuron affects. Uh, coming from the spinal collateral horn of the spinal cord, just affects what we call the uh, the adrenal medulla to secrete no adrenaline and it gets into systemic circulation. Okay, it gets into systemic circulation. So that is what uh, I want you to know here. So that's what I said. Preganglionic neuron really in a sympathetic chain. Yes, in the case of sympathetic, uh, so then the postganglionic neuron to the effector organ. That's how ha what happens. But in case of the adrenal medulla, there's no relay. Okay, so the the from the lateral horn of what we call the spinal cord, yes, the nerve, you know, affects the adrenal medulla directly to secret uh, adrenal hormones. I mean, uh, secret these cardiolamines. Yes, adrenal, no adrenal, even dopamine into what we call the bloodstream. So that is what uh, we have to know. Now, in terms of transmission of impulses, okay, bit from one neuron to the other, then there are two ways in which we transmit impulses. One is by forming what we call electrical synapses, and then the other is by forming what we call chemical synapse. Now, if we talk about the electrical synapse, now you can see that what happens is that this is the presynaptic neuron, and this is the postsynaptic neuron. 
you can see that almost there's no uh, eventually very small space between them and this space is what we are calling the extracellular space the space between these kind of two, two neurons is known as the extracellular space now this extracellular space is bridged by these kind of you know channels which we have created here there's one half channel over here there's another half channel over here we can call them hemi channels okay these channels have what we call gap junctions gap junctions so that substances can move in or out of it now one thing is that each of these kind of hemi channel is made up of six connections now the connection is spelled c-o-n-n-e-x-i-n-s Six connections this way will give us one connection. Now the connection is C O N N E X O N. Now this connection, so this is a connection, this is another connection forming this kind of channel. So similarly, you have this in that manner. Okay, so that is what uh, we are going to see. So uh, one thing is that yes, electrical impulses can move in either direction, it can move this way downwards or it can move upwards in the opposite direction. So it is bidirectional. So one other thing too is that what we have to know is that uh, there's a, some kind of problem which we've identified. What happens is that presynaptic cell depolarize at the same time post one also depolarize. Similarly, you talk about depolarization is the same thing which happens. Okay. So if uh, one, so it means that the problem here is that you can produce a highly compartmentalized system with just electrical synapses, and therefore we have to augment this electrical synapses with what you call a chemical synapse. So in electrical synapse, there's no neurotransmitter secreted. But in case of chemical synapse, there's what you call vesicles. Okay, we have some kind of swellings over here, which will contain what you call vesicles. And these vesicles will contain what you call neurotransmitters. And upon influx of calcium, these neurotransmitters will be released, okay, into what we call the synaptic cleft. So that in the postsynaptic neuron, what happen to those post-synaptic neurons will bear receptors for those neurotransmitters and therefore the i mean the cascade of events will actually take place okay the nerve will i mean the post-synaptic neuron will also get depolarized in that manner okay so one thing is that yes this one is more complex than that of the electrical one because neurons are electrically isolated that's one key thing so that they don't get depolarized at the same time or repolarized at the same time and we say that, yes, chemicals are used to transmit signals between them. And some neurotransmitters depolarize the postsynaptic neuron. Some may hyperpolarize it. So there will be that kind of variation. So not all the time that, yes, this one will be depolarized. Now, one thing is that it means the electrical transmission, sorry, impulse transmission will, will be along only one direction. It will happen only this way. So from the presynaptic to the postsynaptic and not vice versa in case of the electrical synapse. Okay, so that is what we are going to see. And some neurotransmitters have only uh, have only transient effects. Yes, just about one millisecond, and others may have long-lasting effect. Unlike in the case of this, where yes, everything will have to happen at the same time. Okay. Now, one other thing too that we have to know, yes, regarding the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system, yes, is for us to know some kind of distinction between. Uh, some terms okay that we have to know we've seen the word ganglion now anytime you hear the word ganglion they are talking about a group of neurons outside the cns in fact cell bodies okay this one is cell bodies of what we call the neurons outside the cns so in the pns the cell bodies over there are known as ganglia in the case of central nervous system those same cell bodies okay which you find in the cns will now be called nucleus so plural is nuclei okay so that is what we are going to see and then we also have a nerve now if you talk about a nerve we are saying a group of nerve fibers and i'm talking about the axons outside the cnfs is forming a nerve in the case of cns we call it a tract okay tract a group of nerve fibers that's the axons within the cns so you have to get these terms right now, by way of giving some distinction between ganglia and nuclei, yes, we've seen that ganglia, yes, there will be that kind of cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system. In the case of nuclei, there will be that kind of cell bodies, which you find in the CNS. Okay? 
and then one thing too is that yes in the case of <coughs> ganglia ganglia will form what we call plexuses okay so we see those kind of plexuses that we find talking about my entire nerve plexus yes a lot of cell bodies over there of best cell plexus and then for nuclei they okay in gray matter of the brain okay okay in gray matter of the brain now i've told you that for instance if you talk about the basal ganglia yes you are going to be yes although they are gray matter but they will be found inside the white matter you know some examples yes dorsal root ganglia autonomic ganglia as well like cranial nerve ganglia yes in the case of nuclei which i've already mentioned when we look at that you know the basal nuclei yes talk about caudate nuclei you know uh, putamen yes dentate emboliform you know pallidum you know substantial nagla subthalamic nuclei there are some examples that we have now to end with this uh, very long you know uh, lecture or tutorial yes i want to show you i mean at least after the end of this period you should be able to know all the cranial nerves we have 12 pairs of cranial nerves, but we have 31 pairs of spinal nerves, okay? So these 12 pairs of cranial nerves are, yes, the first one, cranial nerve one, is called olfactory, you know, uh, nerve, yes, yeah, because it helps in olfaction, that's in smelling, and to be found in, specifically, in the telencephalon of prosencephalon, okay? So that one will be very important in special sensation. And that type of special sensation is olfaction, okay? Because it will be distributed in the olfactory mucosa of, you know, the nose, nasal cavity. Then cranial nerve 2 will be called optic nerve, okay? Optic has to do with eye vision. Yes, that one will also be coming from this time around. Diencephalon, okay? Of what we call the prosencephalon. And also have a special function because it's going to help, you know, uh, it's going to be distributed in the retina for vision. Now, cranial nerve 3 is called oculomotor nerve. And for oculomotor nerve, oculomotor nerve is coming from the midbrain. That's the mesencephalon. And it's having motor action. So this one is actually going to help something to contract. This one is going to help something to sense, sensory. Okay, so this is motor. Oculomotor is motor in action because the name tells us. And it's going to, you know, supply, yes, intraocular muscles as well as four of what we call the extraocular muscles. So most of the extraocular muscles except two. Okay, so that's what we see. Now, the next one is the cranial nerve four, and that's what we call trochlear nerve. Okay, so for trochlear nerve, it's also found in the midbrain, the mesencephalon, and it's also motor in nature because uh, trochlear nerve, yes, uh, will be supplying what we call the superior oblique muscle. One of the extraocular muscles will be supplied by the trochlear nerve. Now, the next nerve, which is cranial nerve 5, is known as trigeminal nerve. Now, trigeminal nerve, yes, is in the pons specifically, okay, metencephalon, okay, pons. And it's actually a mesnerve. nerve. Trigeminal nerve is a mesnerve, nerve, having both motor function as well as sensory function. And what happens is that, yes, it's going to distribute over areas coming from derivatives of the frontal nasal processes as well as, of course, the first pharyngeal arch. You know, of course, you know, first pharyngeal arch, you know, muscles of mastication, for instance. Okay, that's why, of course, you know, this trigeminal nerve will have actually three parts. We have the mandibular division, uh, 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 what do you call it? You know, maxillary division, you know, all those ones. Okay, so it will be coming from this area. So, for instance, the mandibular division will be supplying muscles of the first pharyngeal arch. Uh, you know, usually we look at all those ones being the mandibular nerve. Then, of course, cranial nerve cysts, that's the abducens nerve, abducens nerve coming from the, I mean, brain stem, especially, spe specifically, okay, uh, specifically coming from what we call the junction between the pons and the medulla, pontomedullary junction, pontomedullary junction is also having motor action because it's supplying one of the extraocular muscles, that's the superior, so lateral rectus muscle, lateral rectus muscle will be supplied by what we call the abducens nerve, and then cranial nerve 7 is a facial nerve, you know, facial nerve also coming from brainstem, but actually specifically coming from the pontu medullary junction. Now, facial nerve is a missed nerve because having both, you know, motu and of course, uh, what you call sensory portions, okay, facial nerve. 
and this one will supply you know muscles that are or structures which are derived from the second pharyngeal arch you know we've talked about you know muscles of uh, facial expression facial nerve will supply them then you have uh, cranial nerve 8 that's the vestibular cochlear nerve cranial nerve 8 vestibular cochlear nerve also coming from the pontomedullary junction having a special type of sensory function because it's going to be found itself in the internal ear okay to help in here and after well as you know uh, uh, what you call balancer then we we'll have cranial nerve 9 cranial nerve 9 is the grosso pharyngeal nerve okay and that one we find it in the medulla that's the myelencephalon it's actually a missed type of nerve and it is derived you know coming from actually you know derivative of the third pharyngeal arch you know talk about cranial nerve 10 that's the vagus nerve also coming from the medulla that's the myelencephalon it's also a missed nerve coming uh, distributing itself in derivative of the fourth pharyngeal arch we look at all those ones and then cranial nerve 11 being the spinal accessory nerve so the spinal accessory nerve you know uh it's actually yes coming from the superior spinal cord okay superior aspect of the spinal cord mm -hmm. just superior aspect of the spinal cord that's why we call it spinal accessory nerve and it's actually a, a motor type of nerve because it's going to supply some muscles the superficial neck region okay so talk about uh, uh, you know the sternocleidomastoid you know those muscles yes yeah, will be supplied by these ones then cranial nerve 12 being the hypoglossal you know glossal has to do with the tongue coming from the brain stem specifically from the medulla the myelencephalon and such a motor in nature supplying muscles of the tongue muscles of the tongue so this rada has been a very long you know overview so in our later sections we will now be delving much into each individual aspect of the nervous system as well as the new anatomy i hope you find this helpful uh, make sure you subscribe to this channel if it is helpful to you so that in future aspect of the new anatomy and other areas of the anatomy yes you will miss any of them have a good night and may god richly bless you